Chapter 10 After long years of work and waiting and endless preparation, it was at last time to attempt the restoration of the monarchy in Bavaria. Many who had given the greater part of their lives to the movement feared that it might be too late. Enak's political headquarters were in the Four Seasons Hotel in Munich. This time I insisted on being with him. The great moment was here at last, and I felt that I could be of some comfort to him during the time of intense nervous strain. All the men who had worked through the years for the monarchy were there, among them Karl Ludwig and old Count Berthold Stauvenberg. The rooms were filled with the clatter of typewriters and the incessant ringing of telephone bells. Politicians came and departed. Everyone was tense with feverish last-minute work. Everything had been done with the utmost secrecy to avoid any Nazi counteraction. But unfortunately, it was impossible to screen all the employees of the hotel. Conferences were held daily with the prince-to-be, Prince Ruprash of Bavaria. He was a person of remarkable talents, highly gifted intellectually and with all the inborn qualities of leadership and statesmanship. He was a man in his sixties, tall and erect and truly kingly, the hope of thousands. During the last days, there were also discussions with members of the Bavarian parliament and meetings withheld the Prime Minister. There was also a visit made to old Reich President von Hindenburg in Berlin. He and von Papa consented to a restoration of the Bavarian democratic monarchy. Early in December, the Reichstag adjourned, and late in January, Chancellor von Schleiser was dismissed, and von Papa was appointed to try to find some compromise with Hitler, who refused to accept the place of vice-chancellor. On the night of February 20th, 1933, in the Four Seasons Hotel in Munich, there was feverish excitement and work. Everything was in readiness, down to the last small detail. The hour for action was set for the morning of February 21st. The Prime Minister was to go to Prince Ruprecht's residence and ask him to accept the reins as King of Bavaria. Troops were in readiness to protect the new regime. Even a record of the Te Deum and one of the old Bavarian anthem, God Bless the King, were sent to the broadcasting station. Everyone worked straight through the night. Toward morning, Ina came to our room to try to get a few hours rest. Although I knew that he was completely exhausted, his face was radiantly happy. Darling, the great day is here. I feel as if I'd stalked and finally gotten my stag. In a few hours, I'll bring him from the forest. It was a true hunter's interpretation of triumph. Enoch had scarcely put his head on the pillow when a crowd gathered in the dark street under our window. Enoch, Enoch, they shouted. We won't have your king. So the Nazi spies had done their work, in spite of every reasonable precaution. My heart froze with terror. Would there be revolution? I remembered the horror of Munich in 1919. I wanted to close my ears to those discordant cries. But most of all, I wanted to shut out the cries so that Enoch could not hear them. He had given so much of his life so much of both of our lives, to this restoration. Nothing must happen now. We were both too tense for sleep. Neither of us spoke. We lay in the darkness, each fighting back our anxiety, not willing to accept even the thought of defeat. Very early in the morning, Enoch and the other men of the restoration assembled in Prince Ruprecht's residence to await the arrival of Prime Minister Held. They had waited long past the appointed hour when, instead of the Prime Minister, one of his officials arrived with a list of new and unacceptable conditions which were to be met before the Prime Minister would yield. Prince Ruprecht's aide de camp was sent at once to find Held, but the Prime Minister was not at the House of Parliament, nor was he at home. No one knew where he was. It was late in the evening when he was finally located, and his excuse for not carrying out his agreed part 
was shallow and unconvincing. He said, There is a slight judicial error in the plan. We shall have to wait. Wait! Wait! It was already too late. There was no longer hope of stopping the Nazi tide. In January, Adolf Hitler had already been appointed Reich Chancellor. Prime Minister Held in Munich was still vacillating when the Reichstag fire in Berlin on February the 27th brought a reign of terror against the communists and Hitler took over control of the entire Reich in what was termed a national emergency. Enoch and I had to hide away in Munich to avoid being taken prisoners by the Nazis. No one, not even our family, had any idea of our whereabouts. Even now, I do not feel free to tell where we hid. I thanked God that the boys were safe in Austria and the girls were with my mother. By the end of March, the Nazi party, by excluding the communists from seats in the Reichstag, secured an absolute majority. Next came crimes against the Jews. Free trade unions were suppressed. The Nazis were in the saddle, but no one dreamed that it would be for long. We were still in hiding as day after day hope receded. I was astonished at Enoch's courage and composure when every moment could mean death. We did not speak about the failure of the restoration until one day I could no longer remain silent. Oh, Enoch, dearest, I can't bear the thought of having your life's work swept away. Is there any hope? He took me in his arms to comfort me. There is always hope, darling. We must not give way to despair. What can you do? I wept. He shook his head. Nothing for the present. Do you think it is God's will that some terrible ordeal should come to Germany? I asked fearfully. Perhaps, but it will not only be Germany which will suffer. It will mean the whole of Europe. I know that he felt the danger very deeply and sincerely. For another day, he himself again brought up the subject of Germany's plight and how it would affect the world. Germany was the heart of Europe, he said, and a sick heart was a dangerous thing. The moral collapse of Germany would upset the equilibrium of the whole world. The long weeks in hiding were like a terrifying nightmare. Finally, we decided to risk leaving our place of hiding and to go to Gutenberg. It seemed unbelievable that Enoch could go on from day to day without breaking down. His whole life had been concentrated on the events which led up to that day of February the 21st, 1933. I knew what deep personal tragedy the failure of the restoration was for him. I knew how difficult it was going to be for him to give up the political activity of a lifetime. There was one good thing which resulted from it all. Enoch was given back to his family and to the serious administration of his estates. This was an opportunity for him really to get to know the children. They were growing to be very individual personalities, especially the boys. Both of them were gay and happy and full of life. Philip Franz was dark-haired, dark-eyed and gifted in music. He already knew and appreciated fine art and he was deeply interested in religion and all things pertaining to the family and tradition. He was demonstrative and never ashamed to show his affection. Karl Theodor was blonde and blue-eyed. Even as a small child, he was extremely temperamental. He was courageous and possessed a very clear and individual way of expressing himself. When he was quite young, he began to write some excellent poetry. Karl Theodor was always reserved and self-possessed and very reluctant to show any emotion. He was also the best pupil in his class, but this strong-willed boy was sometimes a handful to manage. The director of their school in Austria wrote to us, The Gutenberg boys, if you can understand this, are the naughtiest, at the same time the best boys that I have in the school. The little girls were sweet and charming and the special joy to their father. Nivis, now seven, was dark-haired with great round brown eyes and olive skin. 
in her the Spanish and Italian blood, which comes from both sides of our families, was quite evident. Nivis was a serious child with strong likes and dislikes. Teresa, who was four, our little one, was as gay as a lark, with large blue eyes and long blonde curls. She made friends easily with everyone and had a subtle way of getting everything that she wanted. Enoch followed and studied every political move. The Nazi government enacted a law imposing the death penalty on anyone guilty of crimes against public security. Himmler was empowered to use this law to remove any stubborn opposition. We lived in mortal dread that at any moment the Nazis might arrive in Gutenberg to take Enoch away. Every move he made was watched. Every letter was read. Every telephone call registered. There was not a moment when he was not under the cold observation of the Gestapo. Hess was appointed deputy party leader. All existing political parties were banned. Hitler announced Germany's withdrawal from the League of Nations. Many German Protestants were forced to unite in a Reich church. It was amazing to watch the speed with which the paralyzing power of dictatorship and tyranny grew. Demonic forces seemed to remove all obstacles in Hitler's way. His devilishly clever propaganda succeeded in subjecting the best German virtues to his aims. Courage, patriotism, diligent perseverance even to the ultimate sacrifice. He used for his own ends the great German talent for organization and technical perfection. He also knew how to make use of the German weaknesses. Lack of political instinct, a tendency to blind, slavish, even cowardly obedience. Added to this were the criminal tendencies latent in the human makeup, the lust for power in a people devoid of religious belief. People eager to kneel in adoration at the shrine of success with Hitler as God. Here, they cried, was a leader who showed the way to a heaven on earth, a heaven where their God did all their worrying for them, even their thinking. The cry was, put your trust in Hitler. It was at this time that Enoch wrote in his notes, Germany, dear Germany, once you were the heart of Christianity, how low have you fallen? Is this your punishment for having neglected your spiritual destiny in history? Is there hope that some spark that is holy and true may rekindle a fire that will burn out this hideous wound in the heart of Europe? Can the guilt be washed away even by a flood of blood and tears? On a June evening in 1934, we were in the music room in Gutenberg listening to Beethoven over the radio when suddenly the music stopped. The announcer's voice came with the sharp staccato announcement. Revolt against the Führer in Munich, a plot against the regime. Rem, Hitler's best friend, leader of the treacherous plot. Then there was music again, but not Beethoven. Military marches interrupted periodically with new brief announcements. Rem, with his lewd friends, has been captured in Vissi, near Munich. Rem imprisoned in Munich police headquarters. More men involved in the criminal plot. The Führer's wonderful instinct detected the plot in time. The renegades will be rooted out and exterminated to the last man. Enoch had been listening tensely. Here it comes, he said. Sooner than I expected, the dragon begins to devour itself. We sat listening to the broadcasts of the news late into the night. Suddenly, there were heavy blows on the great oak gate, and we heard the shouting of voices. Wagner came into the room, deadly pale. About forty SS men are in the courtyard. They wish to see the Baron. We had no time even to exchange a word. Behind Wagner came the chief of the SS and two of his guards, all in their black SS uniforms. The Gestapo chief strode up to Enoch. In the name of the Führer, I arrest you, Baron George Enoch Gutenberg. Have your things packed, but do not move from this room. I thought I was going to faint. Good God, the thing which we had dreaded for years 
had at last happened. Enoch was so calm that it steadied me. I am ready, he said quietly. We must have your political correspondence. Where is it? The Gestapo chief demanded. Enoch nodded. You may have it. It is in the archives in the basement. Anything that might have been dangerous in Enoch's files had been well hidden. A quarter of an hour passed and we stood still in the centre of the room, not daring to move. While the Gestapo chief went to find the files in the archives, the two guards stood watch over us. These SS men, who had hard, cruel faces, made no attempt to hide their hatred of us. When the Gestapo chief returned, we were ordered to follow him down to the courtyard. Passing into the corridor, we saw that there were black-clad SS men at every door. All the way to the courtyard, I prayed. Cars were waiting at the gate. In a moment, Enoch would be gone. I looked up into the Gestapo chief's face, searching for some glint of human feeling behind that expressionless mask. God made me say to him, It is in your hands that I give the life of my husband. I threw myself into Enoch's arms. Goodbye, my darling. God help you. Goodbye, my dearest. Don't lose courage. The car with Enoch and the Gestapo chief disappeared through the gate, followed by the roaring trucks loaded with SS men. I stood staring into the black, empty courtyard. It had all happened so suddenly that I was stunned. Enoch was gone. He had no part in the Riem plot. But this was the opportunity for which the Nazis had been waiting. Enoch had gone to his death. But where? A few hours later, I left Gutenberg with Karl Ludwig's wife. She was the first person to whom I turned in my anguish. Teresa was one of those rare personalities who, in time of trouble, give themselves completely to the task of helping others. Her calm and clear-headed suggestions gave me courage, and since we felt that the centre of the purge would be in the capital, we decided to drive to Munich as fast as we could. It was dawn, with meadows in bloom and roses everywhere. All the world was beautiful and death in my heart. It was dark when we reached the Hotel Regina in Munich. The sound of dance music came from the lobby, and we passed through a crowd of chattering, overdressed people. We had hoped to find Karl Ludwig in Munich, but we could not find him. He had been there, but he had disappeared. So had everyone else that we knew. In the morning, I went immediately to the Gestapo headquarters in the old Wittelsbach Palace. The huge old red brick palace was familiar to me. It was a long time since I had played in its rooms and visited with the royal princesses. What a change! At the high entrance, I was challenged by SS guards. Inside, through open doors, I could see many of the familiar princely rooms. Everywhere... There was the clatter of typewriters. Everyone was feeling very happy and feeling very important. SS guards kept rushing past me into the corridor. At last I was shown into the presence of the Gestapo chief of Munich. He sat behind an impressive desk. Yes, madam, he asked with icy politeness, which I knew meant hate. I have come to find out where my husband, Baron George Enoch Gutenberg, is detained. It certainly was a mistake imprisoning him. You must know as well as I that he could not have possibly have had any part in the Rome affair. I spoke bravely, but I had already learned that Hitler had, as I had feared, taken advantage of this opportunity to rid himself not only of Rehm and his men, but of many others who were known to oppose the Nazi regime. I can't tell you, madam. We will investigate. Ask again in ten days. Ten days? Most of the prisoners would be dead in ten days. Where was Enoch? Was he alive? Again I searched for some of his political friends. Many of them had also been taken prisoners. Teresa and I heard rumours of the execution of some of the Bavarian politicians. News came to us from Berlin that terror was also rampant in that city. 
At last we discovered that Carl Ludwig was safe. He had been warned in time by a friend, and he was now in hiding. There was no trace of Enoch. Through the blazing summer heat, I walked the streets of Munich, the soft asphalt giving beneath my swollen feet. I searched everywhere for friends, but house after house was deserted. Everyone I knew seemed to have vanished. Some, I learned, had been imprisoned. Finally, in desperation, I went to the Brown House, which was the Hitler headquarters in Munich. There, amid its splendour, I was met with the same studied politeness. We can tell you nothing. Wait until you hear from us. At last I found Baroness A, who knew an important man in the Wittelsbach Palace. I implored her help. After days of waiting, she finally called me. Good news, Elizabeth. I have learned that Enoch is imprisoned in the Munich police headquarters, cell 46. You may see him tomorrow at noon. Cell 46. It flashed through my mind that it had been cell 46 in which Enoch was imprisoned by the communists 15 years ago. He was alive. Father in heaven, you have saved his life in these days of murder. I wept with joys. The hours dragged until morning. I showed my pass to the stony-faced SS men at the entrance to the prison. It was a long journey through the bare, smelly corridors. The civil guards were very different. Come, one of them said, your husband is waiting for you. Don't be afraid, we take good care of him. We know him from better days. But I knew that they did not have the power to protect him. The waiting room was a drab, dark parlour. At a desert was a criminal commissary, absorbed in his writing. I sat down on a small bench and waited. At last the door opened and Enoch entered. I rushed into his outstretched arms. Hello, darling, he cried joyfully. I knew that you would find your way to me. He put his hand under my chin and looked down into my eyes. Don't look so sad. Everything is going to be all right. I have gotten used to my tiny cell. And do you know something astonishing? I have been in it before. I managed to fill my days methodically, and that is a great help. Please try to see the Gestapo. Tell them that I wish to know the reason for my imprisonment. Tell them that I have a right to know, and that I have a right to a trial. I glanced toward the man at the desk, and then tried to tell Enoch with my eyes what I could not say aloud. Right? Darling, right no longer exists. Don't worry too much, my love, he went on. There is nothing that happens without meaning. We looked at each other long and tenderly. I'm allowed to read. Try to bring me some books. The Summa of St. Thomas, for instance. And please, something amusing too. I need something to make me laugh. I shall do what I can, dearest. Oh, and there is another thing. I want you to send me something to discourage the bedbugs. I'm literally devoured by them. Ten minutes are up, the criminal commissary announced. It could not have been ten minutes. I looked at Enoch frantically. God bless you, my darling. God bless you and try to come again soon, Enoch called as he was taken back to his cell. There were ten agonizing days without permission to see him. Days with death striking on all sides. Ten days with the terror of death in my heart. Secretly I went to see the Capuchin father, who was still permitted to visit the prisons. Yes, my dear, I have seen your husband, and he is well, actually in the very best state of soul, and you know that is all that matters. You are right, father, but... He gave me a smile. Nothing happens but the will of God. He said it as if it were intended to answer all the questions which were on my lips. Again I made a trip to Gestapo headquarters and spoke of Enoch's right to a trial. Madam, perhaps a trial can be arranged. Another visit? You already had the privilege of seeing your husband. 
All I could do was to wait. Finally, a message came to the Hotel Regina. Baroness Gutenberg, you may see your husband today at 12 o'clock. It was then nearly noon. I almost flew to the prison. The same dark parlour, the same man at the desk, the same radiant smile on Enoch's face. Elizabeth, how happy I am that you are here. I got the books. What a unique opportunity to read Thomas Aquinas in peace. You know, I was perfectly happy with him. And you can't imagine how I laughed over Slezak's memoirs. That was a wonderful choice. By the way, do you know that you nearly killed me? My God, how? Your wonderful bug powder killed the bugs all right, but it almost killed me. I was so glad to get it that I spread it around too generously in my little cell. I nearly suffocated. You should have seen the gymnastics trying to keep my nose up toward my one small ventilator. We laughed heartily. Oh, how good it was to laugh. What about my trial? Enoch asked anxiously. I did not wish to tell him my fears that there was not going to be a trial. They told me that it might possibly be soon. I could see his relief. I'm allowed to write. Please send me some sheets of writing paper. We sat in tense silence, our eyes saying all the things which were in our hearts. I'm worried, Enoch. Don't worry, darling. This is a wonderful experience I'm going through. Some day I shall tell you more. But in this absolute solitude, only the final important things seem to matter, and one gets so near them. Ten minutes, the man at the desk called out. How I love you, Enoch, darling. My eyes clung to him as we parted. Would I ever see him again? There was a tiny shop around the corner from the prison where I asked for writing paper to send back to Enoch. While I waited for my package, a small picture of the newly canonised Bavarian saint, Frater Conrad, caught my eye. As I studied the face of the old monk, I felt that he was offering to help me in my extremity. I bought the small picture of Frater Conrad and took it back to the hotel with me. I showed it to Teresa and told her about my visit with Enoch. She had good news. Karl Ludwig was quite safely away from Munich. Let's get something to eat, she suggested. I could not eat until you came back. You really must eat something, or you will soon begin to look like a scarecrow and not able to charm the Gestapo. We went down to the lobby. The place always seemed to be throbbing with jazz music and laughing people. How could people dance and laugh in the midst of so much death and suffering? We had just begun to eat when I suddenly remembered that I had left all my papers in my room. I rushed up the stairs to discover two men in the room working on a ladder just above our window. What is the matter? I asked suspiciously. They seemed very much surprised to see me. Oh, we're going to repair the curtains. The curtains seem perfectly all right to me, I retorted. Later... Teresa and I searched and discovered a microphone well hidden in the curtains. Someone had given those men the signal that Teresa and I had gone down to lunch. We were very polite to that microphone. The Gestapo would learn nothing from us. A friend who had managed to get an English newspaper called us and asked us to come to her house. On the front page was the account of the revolt in Munich. In the centre of the page was a black-bordered box with the list of the dead. Enoch's name was among them. I thanked God that I had seen him that day, but it filled me with a paralysing fear. When I returned to the hotel, I decided to make a novena, nine days of prayer in honour of St. Conrad. The following day I had luncheon with Baroness A. She was a wonderful help, so cheerful and encouraging. Tomorrow, she told me, my novena to Frater Conrad ends. I have made it for our dear mutual friend, Baron Redwitz, who is in terrible danger in the Dachau concentration camp. I am sure that the good saint will help us. Frater Conrad, I exclaimed in surprise. What a coincidence. Today I myself began a novena in his honour for Enoch. The next day, Baron Redwitz came home. 
his head shaved like a criminal's, the terrifying experiences of his imprisonment in the dread Dachau camp imprinted on his face. Then there followed for me nine days of anguish with no permission to visit Anak. I knew that every hour which passed might be the hour of death. The good faithful men of Gutenberg had sent a petition to the Führer asking for Enoch's liberation. It was the first faint hope. Here was a way for good Frater Conrad to help, to get the petition there in time. But what was so important into the hands of someone who might act? The Baroness A. again invited me for luncheon, but I could not swallow. The food refused to leave my throat. Today is the ninth day, I kept saying over and over to myself. The ninth day, the ninth day. It would have to be a miracle if Enoch were freed, for from all sides we heard of more and more men who had been put to death. There was a glass door directly across from me, leading into the entrance hall. The doorbell rang and the shadow of a tall man was cast against the glass. Then the door opened and Enoch stood there. I could not believe it was actually he until I was in his arms. Thank God! Oh, thank you, God, for this miracle, I cried. We hurried back to the Hotel Regina, on the way deciding to leave Munich within the hour, before anyone in the Wittelsbach Palace could change his mind. I threw things into my bags and Enoch rid himself of the prison stench in a pine-scented bath. I walked the floor while he enjoyed the luxury, and if I had not kept after him, he would have been in the bath for hours. The experience in Munich made me very careful not to discuss anything while we were in the hotel. It was decided that Teresa would return home by train. Enoch read my thoughts, for he said that we would not go back to stay in Gutenberg, not for a while. Once in the car with Enoch at the wheel and Munich behind us, I again could breathe. Oh, Enoch, let's leave Germany, I pleaded. Let's go to Uncle Bishop in Hungary. Yes, I had thought of that too. But first I must see my decent Gestapo chief, the one who arrested me in Gutenberg. He saved my life by keeping me in his Wurzburg prison and against orders too. If he had taken me direct in Munich, I would have been killed immediately with many others. So the road along which we were racing led to Wurzburg. It was wonderful to be able to talk without fear of a microphone. I told Enoch everything that had happened in Munich and about Karl Ludwig's escape, and then he told me of an edifying experience which he had had in prison. Cell 46, in which Enoch had been placed, was the one which Dr. Fritz Gerlich had recently occupied and from which he had been taken to torture and death. This cell, in fact the entire prison, had seemed to be filled with an atmosphere of sanctity. All during his imprisonment, Dr. Gerlich had been an inspiration to the other prisoners and Enoch's cell seemed to be permeated with the aura of the doctor's rare spirituality. The story of Dr. Fritz Gerlich was an interesting one. A cousin of ours, Baron Areton, had been editor of one of our most important Munich newspapers. He had always been an ardent Catholic, and when the case of Theresa Newman first became of public interest in 1926, he went to cover the story at Kunersreuth. He stayed there far longer than he had intended, returning to Munich overwhelmed by what he had seen. Being highly spiritual, he recognized the greatness and importance of Teresa Newman's message to the world. It was Baron Areton who wrote the first articles about Teresa Newman. His close friend, the co-editor of the newspaper, was Dr. Fritz Gerlich, an atheist. When the doctor saw the profound impression made on Areton by what he had seen in Kunersreuth, he decided to prove to his friend that he had been taken in by a cheap fake. Dr. Gerlich went to Kunersreuth, convinced that he would be able quickly and easily to unmask this hoax. 
The doctor had intended to stay only a few days for his investigation. He stayed three weeks, and while there, he posed as a devout Catholic in order to get more readily the necessary information. Teresa Newman, with her gift of perception, immediately told Father Neighbour that Dr. Gerlish was only posing as a Catholic and not to trust him, that he did not even believe in God. Dr. Gerlish left Kunersreuth, a Catholic. He resigned from the Munich newspaper to publish a weekly paper of his own, Der Gerard Wege. This publication was strongly Catholic and even more strongly anti-Nazi. As a result, Dr. Gerlich was one of the first men thrown into prison when the Nazis took over in Bavaria. Dr. Gerlich had lived in cell 46 until the day when he had undergone his last martyrdom for his faith. Some time later, I told Teresa Newman about Enoch's wonderful experience in actually feeling the holiness of the doctor which permeated his cell. And she said, Your doctor was correct in speaking of the saintly death of Dr. Gerlish. He died a martyr for his faith. In a vision on All Saints' Day, I saw my friend the doctor among the saints. Only a few years in this man's life from bitter atheism to sanctified martyrdom. After Enoch had told me about Dr. Gerlish, we discussed other friends who had died in the terrible purge. In the end, there were over a thousand men who were killed. In Würzburg, we did not even stop at our house in the Herengasse, but went directly to the headquarters of the Gestapo. Enoch, with light step, rushed up to the entrance and disappeared. I sat in the car, trembling and praying. I was sure that he had walked back into the jaws of death. After a short time, Ina came out smiling and happy and climbed into the car. I'm so glad that I came. This man is good. He was astonished to see me and very pleased. He told me to give you his greetings. He said, Tell madam that there are human feelings, even in the Gestapo. How my heart went out to that Gestapo chief in gratitude. I did not dream at that time that 12 years later I would be able to give concrete expression to that gratitude. I gave a statement about a man's courage and assistance, which was of utmost importance to him when he was on trial for having been the Gestapo chief of Würzburg.